Good morning, welcome to this week's Learn with Lorna. So welcome to uh, Learn with Lorna 124, where we're looking at war memorials, the reminders that sit in our landscape. This series is brought to you by High Life Island at no cost to the viewer. And High Life Island is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of events. But as I always say, if you're able to donate towards our work uh, via our website or uh, in the donation boxes in our buildings, then we're very grateful for that and it enables us to continue doing what we do. The Highland Archive Service, as you will be aware, has four archive centres across the north of Scotland. We have one in Inverness, one in Wick, one in Portree and one in Fort William. We're moving uh, this month into November and our theme for this month is living in the landscape. Uh, today's one, as I said, uh, it was looking at war memorials. I uh, am intending to be bang on time today as I need to finish and go and uh, speak at a school this afternoon. So if I'm still talking at half past 11, someone flag me and tell me to stop. So we're, um, as I say, speaking about living in the landscape this month, and we've had all sorts of interesting posts across our Facebook pages, which um, I know lots of people have been enjoying. But I wanted to link that specifically this week to the subject of remembrance, as we're, of course, in that period of national and international commemoration for lives lost uh, in conflict. And the landscape of the Highlands, just like the rest of the UK, is punctuated by war memorials. And I would be interested, Jen and other people across different countries, if you could let me know what your landscape is like in this respect, because almost every city, town and village across the UK has a memorial to those from that area who gave their lives in World War One, in World War Two, and also in subsequent wars. Um, it's really so much a part of what we see in every community in this country. You could expect every community to have a hall, a school, a church, a war memorial. And so I wanted to look at some of those. But first of all, I wanted to look back further in time a little bit at some other um, war memorials and the extent to which we've always tried to mark conflict. We've always built memorials to the memory of a person or the memory of an event, things like gravestones and tombs and pyramids with inscriptions, all of those sorts of things are that need for humans to mark what a life contributed and what a difference somebody made or an event made. And they can serve various purposes. So we have war memorials that commemorate an achievement or uh, of, you know, of a particular battalion or a particular person. We have um, ones that remind us of a service that people have given or something that happened. War memorials can pass on a message or a statement as we look at who and what we choose to memorialise. What do we choose? You know, this has been a huge subject in the UK and, and across the world of what do we choose to put statues up to? What events matter to us to mark? But the other thing that monuments and memorials can do, and this is perhaps particularly true of war memorials, is that they can serve as a warning. Um, there's some something in our collective memory that we not only want to mark and acknowledge the sacrifices that have been made by a generation or several generations, but also I think when a lot of the First World War memorials were put up, they were seen as drawing a line in the sand to prevent the next generation doing the same thing. And of course, that very rarely works and didn't work particularly with that uh, after the First World War. I mentioned, um, I'll come back to this, but I've recently been recording some interviews with people whose lives have been shattered by recent conflict. So although we put those memorials up as a testament to what's happened before and a, perhaps a warning against the future, we know that that doesn't always work. So going back centuries, I've spoken quite a lot in the last few months about place names and memories of battles past are entrenched in our landscape in this country. There are numerous battle sites of, of hundreds of years ago and many of them have a memorial of some sort erected on or near them or the memory of that battle lives on in the name. 
and there are hundreds of these. So, for instance, we have a place called Battlefield. We have Loch in a Ka, uh, which is the, the little loch of the battle. And there are loads of these where something in that place name, even if the detail is forgotten, there's an acknowledgement of the fact that a battle took place on that site. <clears throat> Sorry, still the same cough. Some, even if they don't live on in a specific place name, can still be found in our maps, in our first and second uh, generally, uh, first and second edition ordnance survey maps. You can see maybe not the name of a battle, but an, a mark that a battle has taken place somewhere. There are thousands of these. So for instance, there's this one in Holkirk in Caithness, and this is how the Ordnance Survey name book uh, records it. And you may recall that when the first edition Ordnance Survey maps were produced in the 1860s, 70s, uh, an accompanying series of books went alongside it. So every place name that appears on the map has uh, a, a reference within the books that tells you more about it. And this is one in Holkirk. And on the map it's marked as Site of Conflict Between Clans Gunn and McKeever, AD 1594. This battle was fought in, in 1594 between the clans Gunn and McKeever. The latter is said to have been encamped on an eminence near Pulliower, where the remains of a circular embankment is still to be seen and is pointed out as Site of Camp. Another of the same is said to have stood about a quarter of a mile to the east, the site of which has been shown to me. The McKeevers were stationed at Camp Number One when a division of the guns advanced to the Pulliar Ford and sent their sharpshooters to intercept them. The guns, however, caused them to retreat to the summit of the hill, where, when they were engaged hand to hand, a second division of Clan Gun forded the river below Longside and came unobserved to the rear of their enemy, who expected no danger from that quarter. The McKeevers were nearly all killed with their chief, who fell uh, among the first. This battlefield was pointed out to Captain Gunn uh, Breyer in, 13, in 1835, at which date none of it had been cultivated. Heaps of stones were then to be seen which marked the graves of the fallen, but it is now in cultivation and none of those stones are to be seen. And that extract from, the first, from that uh, OS name book goes on to say that they knew roughly where the battle had happened, they knew roughly where the graves of the people who had been killed were, but now there's no remaining trace of them. And that, of course, is something that goes on to be painfully familiar for us, either the graves of soldiers being forgotten or lost or simply never being known about in the first place. And as I say, something that we are still dealing with today. But we've put, in addition to that, we have sought to put up permanent reminders uh, and the landscape of the Highlands bears many of those, many cairns and plaques and monuments erected to ensure that battles and lives and even individuals are remembered. And these go back centuries. Here's a description of the Battle of Blair Coy in Rothshire, along with a description of its memorial cairn. And again, uh, this is from the uh, OS name book. So they're talking uh, of the site of the ba Battle of Blair, uh, Blair Coy, Blair and Coy. This name applies to the spot where a sanguinary battle was fought between the inhabitants of Inverness and the Macdonalds of the Isles about the year 1340. It is averred that Macdonalds came in great force and threatened to burn and pillage Inverness if the inhabitants did not pay a ransom, to which summons the authorities of Inverness replied they would give a definite answer in a few hours and sent a boat laden with brandy, rum and provisions to the Macdonalds as a, a peace offering of which they partook so liberally that they were soon drunk, at which time the army from Inverness, assisted by the country people, fell upon them unawares and slew a great many and utterly routed the remainder of the Macdonalds. There is a large cairn erected on the spot where the battle raged most fiercely to commemorate this event. It is on the property of the trustees of the late Sir Colin Mac uh, Mackenzie of, of Belmaduthy. It goes on to describe the cairn as erected in about the year 1340 to commemorate the Battle of Blairnacoy. Blair the cairn is entirely composed of stones, about two or three pounds in weight, up to 30 or 40. The cairn is 70 feet in diameter and about 10 or 12 feet high, and it is situated in the northern side of the district of Drumspittle. And that battle was in the 1340s. I'm, I'm not sure it says there that the cairn was erected at the same time. Uh, I'm not sure if they would be able to prove that or not. But 
one of the most famous um, cairns commemorating a battle in this part of the world stands, of course, on the field at Culloden. There was an attempt to, at a battle in, uh, sorry, at a cairn in 1858, but the one that stands on the battlefield now was erected by Duncan Forbes of Culloden in 1881. It's 20 feet high and it reads on it, a plaque that reads on it, the Battle of Culloden was fought on this moor, 16th of April, 1746. The graves of the gallant Highlanders who fought for Scotland and Prince Charlie are marked by the names of their clans. A very um, simplified 19th century description of the Jacobite complex there, but the point is that they're marking both an event but also a mass loss of life. And also on that same site there are um, the graves of the clans naming specific families who fought and it's one of the great sadnesses that those are currently um, undergoing some damage because the amount of people who are standing uh, around them looking at them. Um, a geographical survey that was undertaken at Culloden in 2001 revealed that there are graves on that site so those that big memorial and those smaller um, clan stones are marking grave sites and so far that's what I've been talking about graves and memorials and cairns and plaques and, that are erected on the very site or near to the spot that a battle had been fought but thank goodness thank everything there hasn't been a full-scale battle fought on British soil since that day in 1746 there have been some fights and some skirmishes and some other things that claim to be the last battle fought but in terms of a huge um, mass loss of life in a battle setting it's generally believed that Culloden is the last battle fought in Britain so we're um, you know nearly 300 years past that so what happens then when you want to mark a battle or a war that's happened further away that local people have gone to have served in and have been killed in but you're not in the place where that happened to be able to mark it uh, in the same way. There are examples right across the Highlands of monuments and tributes to such battles. There are numerous houses called uh, Trafalgar or Waterloo. I even found one uh, named Waterloo on Wellington Road. And some of those are named to uh, commemorate the battle. Some were named that because they were built on the day or completed on the day that the battle was won. Um, and of course, we, we do that name, now with naming children. You see that in the whole re, uh, swathe of World War I babies with the names of battles uh, put in as their middle names. <clears throat> and then, of course, there are memorials. And everyone, anyone who is familiar with the Abbey Moor area will probably know the Duke of Gordon Monument, which sits uh, uh, on Tor Alvey as you go between um, Abbey Moor and King Craig. You can see the tall monument on the hill. But if what people might not know unless they've been up to it is that on the same hill just tucked down the side there is a smaller monument called the Waterloo Cairn and this is how the OS name book describes it. This is a dry stone built cairn built by the late Duke of Gordon to the memory of the soldiers of the 42nd and 74th Highlanders who felt, fell at the Battle of Waterloo. Placed on the southern end of Toralvi it is about 12 feet high and bears a suitable inscription on a copper plate built on one side. And that suitable inscription reads like this. To the memory of Sir Robert Macara of the 42nd Regiment or Royal Highlanders, Colonel John Cameron of the 92nd Regiment or Gordon Highlanders, and their brave countrymen who gloriously fell at the Battle of Waterloo in June 1815, erected by the most noble, the Marquess of Huntley, 16th of August 1815. So interesting there that it was erected eight weeks after the battle, uh, not like the 135 years it took for the Culloden uh, memorial to be up. And my feeling on that, and I, I don't know and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, but my feeling on that is probably because it's not an internal conflict. Um, you know, Culloden and those the, the Jacobite Rising split families, split communities, um, as people took sides, whereas something like the Battle of Waterloo, the country by and large would have been united in a, in a, uh, a cause and therefore probably it was quite easier to put up a memorial more quickly. Um, it's also interesting that that names specific individuals 
So something that the others that I've mentioned so far haven't um, done. I mentioned that the last full battle in Britain was in 18, it was in 1746. Um, although, as I say, we've certainly have had blood spilt since and people killed as a result of conflict in this country, like the Blitz and various other things. But the landscape of the Highlands itself hasn't been scarred by war in recent years, unlike vast swathes of Europe, which have changed beyond all recognition in the last hundred or so years, and of course, tragically continue to do so. Those rows of graves in the World War I battlefields, and I saw you, uh, Katrina, mentioning that there, um, the rows of graves on the World War I battlefields, those huge memorials that stand in Ypres, uh, the, the Thiepval uh, memorial to the missing of the Somme, the, the memorials of Luz, of Arras, of Dunkirk, those huge memorials and those lines and lines as far as the eye can see of graves testify to not only the lives lost but the devastation wrought on the landscape. The 20th century and of course the 21st century now are have been brutal and as everyone knows we saw loss of life on a scale that we could never possibly have predicted and the people who went into World War One could never have predicted the loss of life that would happen and I've told the stories of some of the people who are in our records in, in previous episodes the story of Alan Cameron of Malcolm Blaine and of others who were lost and people from across the Highlands and across the country, of course, were killed in those conflicts and are commemorated on those memorials, both in the countries they fell, but also in the places where they, that they left to go and fight. So as an example, Malcolm Blaine is commemorated on at least the Lewes Memorial, the War Memorial at Winkfield, so that's already covering continental Europe and England, the Inverness Cathedral Roll of Honour, a family memorial in the, uh, their local church, Oxford University, Eton School. And it's that, ma that multifaceted approach of marking each place that his life had impacted, every place that he'd come into uh, contact with people is marking it. So we go to a new, a new way of commemorating loss of life. Really large scale memorial building, of course, started after World War I as communities wanted to do something to remember the sacrifices that had been made by local people, their husbands, their sons, their brothers, and predominantly it is men, although of course there are women serving or contributing in other ways who are acknowledged in, in those memorials. And we hold numerous documents about war memorials in our collections across all four offices, from minutes of committees that have been set up to build them, to references in school logbooks of pupils fundraising for war memorials to be constructed. We hold drawings of memorials, we hold photographs, council minutes regarding the locations that memorials were to be erected, church records that talk about the impact on a local community. So as an example, the Durinish Parish Council minutes uh, from March 1919 talk about the erection of a suitable memorial and they say this is the prevailing feeling among the people that there's a desire to build a suitable memorial for those from this parish who have given their lives. To take an example, and as I say, there's no way I could touch on all of them as there are so many, um, but to take our Desir War Memorial as an example, we have correspondence between the War Memorial Committee, the local council, and the Campbellton Water Management Committee who owned the land that memorial was built on. So there's references there to the practicalities of building a memorial, of how you get control of the land, who owns it, who can give access to it, who are you um, giving the job to of designing a memorial, of building it, of paying for it, how are you fundraising for it? And then things like the church records or family papers, for instance, the Lochiel papers uh, in Loch Aber, because Alan Cameron was uh, from a Lochiel, um, Lochiel family, there are references in there to the impact on the family and why that family are contributing to the Achnacari Memorial being built. So you can see across different collection types the different aspects of pulling together a memorial. So as I say for our Desir we have the correspondence between the War Memorial Committee, 
the local council, the water management committee who own the site. And that collection includes plans of the site and references to Captain Shaw, who was heavily involved in constructing and fundraising for the Ardis here War Memorial. And I've mentioned him before when I did the episode on the history of Central Primary School, because he had been a teacher in Ardis here and then went on to Central Primary in Inverness. But even after he moved, he's absolutely central to still um, to still supporting that the construction of that memorial. And when we look at the Ardisir school logbooks, we can see him fundraising uh, to ensure that that um, is built. And again, that, that interaction between the school, the church, you can see how much it's a community effort to mark the lives of a community that's been impacted. And we can see that still in, in attacks that happen around the world and in our communities. A community will pull together to mark something that has affected them all. My colleague Anne, uh, our family historian, has been involved in marking the anniversaries of conflict and of specific memorial construction. So, for instance, uh, she took part in an event to mark uh, uh, the, the Doors War Memorial, a beautiful, artistic, um, extraordinary memorial. Uh, and she took part in that, where she does things like this. So um, she's taken every name on the War Memorial. I don't know how clearly you can see that. Um, but taken every name on the memorial and produced a book uh, about each person who, ser who served and whose name is referenced there. So she's done things like that, but she's also done um, marking the likes of Dokara uh, Memorial. Now, that's a slightly different one. It's an, it was an interesting project because she was researching the names that appeared on an old wooden war memorial um, which had been lost and then rediscovered. And there were nine names on the memorial, including uh, one uh, one lady called Wilhelmina Cumming. And that's a World War II memorial list. And it was the, the board had been lost, had been refound. And Anne helped to trace the stories of those individuals named on the memorial, reveal information about their lives, and then took part uh, in a service of remembrance where a new and identical memorial was unveiled at the village hall. Um, where uh, surviving members of the descendants of those named on the memorial were in attendance. Um, it's, in, it's interesting actually that our, I said it's mainly men named on memorials, and it is, but there are some women um, like Wilhelmina Cumming. In Portree, for instance, there's one woman on the memorial there, Lance Corporal Alexandrina Buchanan. And Doc Arach isn't the only village hall that has that connection to conflict. So that, that memorial that's been um, recommissioned and uh, set up is part of that, that community, central to that community about being associated with the hall. And there are many halls across the Highlands that have that, are memorial halls that were built as a memorial. So for instance, in Skabost in Skye, the memorial hall is dedicated to the men from the Skabost district who fell in World War II and Palestine. And that was a gift from Duncan MacLeod of Skabost with local contributions from people. And it was a deliberate choice to build something for the community. So they chose not to build a memorial, but to build a hall in, in memoriam. Something that could be used to bring the community together again after such devastation. And it's still used by the community for a huge number of purposes. And there are many others like that across the Highlands. Some memorials record people of um, wide, I don't know how to word this, really, sort of wider reputation, people who are known for another reason. So, for instance, the War Memorial at Elandonan Castle, which was uh, constructed in, 18, in 1932, includes the Canadian uh, Lieutenant Colonel John McCrae, who wrote In Flanders Fields. And so there are, you can find people who are of particular interest or significance. But of course, every name that appears on those memorials is of significance to that community and to those to that family. I wanted to uh, share a bit about the Glenelg War Memorial because my colleague Catherine um, wanted uh, when I was saying, and you know, I'm talking about war memorials, and she said she wrote this sentence to me: "The Glenelg War Memorial is rather haunting. I've camped on the beach next to it, and I often just stare at it for a while." And I just thought that was really um, 
quite touching because I think that's something we do with memorials. We have an emotional connection to them. We we take a moment to think and to look and to pause at them. And this is um, how uh, Jamie at Ambala has described the Glenelg War Memorial. Glenelg is a scattered community around the shores of Glenelg Bay. It looks across the sky and is home to the Glenelg Ferry, which takes passengers in a few cars across to Kyleia on Skye. The village's War Memorial, which is Category A listed, the highest grade in Scottish listed buildings categories, overlooks the bay and the Sound of Sleet and commemorates the dead of the two world wars. It was commissioned by the owner of Glenelg Estate, Lady Scott, who wished to commemorate the local men who had been killed during World War I. It is an arresting sight. The theme of this sculpture is peace and victory coming to the aid of humanity. The memorial is composed of a stone pedestal surmounted by a bronze sculpture which shows the angel of peace holding aloft the wreath, the wreath of victory while a kilted Highland soldier with his head bows head bowed, stands over a stricken female figure. Other symbols, all representing epic tragedy, include a strangled dove, a smashed crown and a ruptured drumskin. The memorial was designed by Robert S. Lorimer, who also created the Scottish National War Memorial. It was sculpted by Lewis Reed Dukers and cast in the Albion Art Factory in London. It was dedicated on the 23rd of October 1920 and unveiled by the local MP Sir John Banner. The inscription reads, 1914 to 1919, to the glory of God and in honoured memory of the officers, non-commissioned officers and men who gave their lives for their country in the Great War. Their name liveth forevermore, also those who fell in the Second World War, 1939 to 1945. And among the names uh, included on that memorial is Major Valentine Fleming, father of Ian Fleming of James Bond fame. And every community across the country will have a, a story like that, a, a, a memorial that they have designed, thought about, pulled together. One of the most famous war memorials in the Highlands, of course, is the Commando Memorial at Spianbridge, which the third statistical account records like this. I don't often talk about the third statistical accounts, which were produced in the uh, around about the 1960s. But this is how the third statistical account records the Commando Memorial. A monument has been erected to commemorate the fallen commando troops who received their basic training in this district. These troops were trained to act as spearheads in the invasions of North Africa and the European continent during the Second World War. The monument, designed by Mr Scott Sutherland, RASA of the Dundee School of Art, consists of three formidable bronze figures, nine feet tall, wearing commando uniform and standing close together on a six foot high grey stone pedestal gazing across the wide moor to the Nevis Mountains. Many thousands gathered from all parts of the country for the unveiling ceremony, which was performed by Her Majesty the Queen Mother on the 27th of September, 1952. It is a beautiful, beautiful, striking monument, and it is very well loved by locals, by tourists, by ex and current service people. That extract records that it was um, uh, opened in September 1952, meaning that 2022 is its 70th anniversary. Within our borough of Fort William collection in Lochaber Archive Centre, we hold references to the memorial's construction and opening. So for instance, these minutes. Commando Memorial. Red letter of the 16th alt from Lord Lovett regarding the visit of the Queen Mother to unveil the Commando Memorial on the 27th. Uh, Lord Lovett suggests that the council might associate itself with the ceremony and it was decided that the provost and the ex-provost Cameron should meet him on the site tomorrow at 11am to discuss the arrangements for the ceremony. As at present uh, advised, the town council would be prepared to bear the expense of a service uh, of buses between Spianbridge station and the site. So the, the council is willing to pay for transportation on the day and they would also ascertain the names of householders in the borough who are prepared to offer hospitality to ex-commandos attending the function. It also goes on to say that the canteen arrangements have been discussed and that Captain Mackenzie of the Grand Hotel has also volunteered to come along and discuss what they can contribute to the opening ceremony. And it's a very particular thing 
around war memorials that, that still pull communities together. And that connection that Loch Aber has to the commandos and that the commandos have and, and service people have to, to Loch Aber remains very, very strong to that to this day. And every year, hundreds of service people make their way to Spean Bridge at this time of year to acknowledge the service of those who went before them. If you're interested in hearing more specifically about that extraordinary connection between Loch Aber and the forces, then uh, we're holding an event at West Highland Museum in Fort William on Saturday, where my colleagues Peter and Rory will be speaking about that, along with uh, people from the commandos and from the museum. Finally, I wanted to, to finish by saying that we continue to build and we continue to need war memorials some for ongoing conflicts, so we're still erecting uh, memorials for conflicts that have happened since the Second World War, but also some for those whose contribution in that those big two global conflicts are at risk of being forgotten. Now, I've previously spoken about my wonderful top colleague, Jamie Goutroger from Ambala, and I wanted to finish by telling you about a project that his mother, Alison, has been instrumental in, which is constructing, uh, erecting and explaining a monument uh, marking the service of the Czech and Slovak agents who trained in Arasig. Let me read the story to you exactly as Alison told it to me. In 2009, the then Czech Honorary Council in Edinburgh devised a plan to raise sufficient funds to commission a memorial which would commemorate Czech and Slovak agents trained by the Special Operations Executive who lost their lives fighting for their country. He chose Arasig as the site for the memorial as it had been the centre of the paramilitary training of the operatives. Two names have become famous and their link with Arasig brings many visitors on almost what is almost a pilgrimage. These two men, Jan Kubis and Josef Gabcik, were chosen to be part of the mission Operation Anthropoid to assassinate Reinhard Heydrich, key architect of the Holocaust. The story was most recently told in the film Anthropoid. The mission was ultimately successful in that Heydrich was killed, but the reprisals exacted afterwards by the Germans were terrible. The two agents who both died in the aftermath are regarded as heroes. The original granite slabs between the memorial bore the names of the 71 agents who died fighting for freedom. Four slightly st smaller stones have now been added and these bear the names of those who fought and survived, 188 names. These new stones, along with a new interpretive panel, were unveiled last Friday on 4th, the 4th of November in the presence of the Czech ambassador to the UK, Maria Ch uh, Chatarova, along with descendants of those whose names are inscribed on the stone. I mentioned there that there was a new interpretive panel set up last week, and this is what the panel says. In 1941, the Special Operations Executive set up covert parliament. Pa I'll just read the whole thing again. In 1941, the Special Operations Executive, the SOE, set up covert paramilitary training bases in the Arasig area to train their agents in specialised combat methods. Many Czech and Slovak volunteers secretly arrived here and were assigned to specific operations before being parachuted into Nazi-occupied Bohemia, Moravia and the Slovak Republic. In summer 1940, discussions took place among the British Foreign and War Office, <coughs> the Ministry of Economic Warfare and the Special Intelligence Service. The remote and inhospitable terrain around Arasig was ideal training ground in the deadly skills of sabotage and subversion. <coughs> Excuse me. It goes on to describe the training. And then it says, during the process of creating this memorial, it was decided to move away from a traditional figurative concept and commission a modern sculpture. Internationally designed, internationally renowned Czech sculptor, Josef Vajas designed the sculpture, which is made from Czech granite and takes the form of a landing parachute, representing the vital tool used in these operations. It is intended as a symbol of hope rising out of the self-sacrifice of these heroes. <coughs> Sorry. 
it is a beautiful memorial, an, an unusual memorial, and beautiful that it's designed by a Czech and built from Czech granite. If you want to find out more, then you can go to the Land, Sea and Island Centre in Arasi that tell the story of the impact um, that these people had on the landscape and that the landscape had on them. Of course, we continue to have wars and we continue to live in an incredibly unsettled world right now and it's more important than ever to acknowledge sacrifice for freedom. I had the very great privilege yesterday of recording an oral history with someone who came to the Highlands after living through the horrors of the war in Syria. It's one of the most important things I've ever been able to do in my job and it was as I say a, a genuine privilege to listen to that story. We still need to remember those whose lives are shattered by war, those who gave in the past, those who continue to give today. Whatever you're doing tomorrow and this weekend, I hope you can find a moment to pause and to think about all of the lives lost, past and present. Thank you very much for listening uh, and joining me today. My apologies again for the cough. I'm going to go away and try and get better. I hope you can join me next week when I'll be looking at some stories from Rassi. In the meantime, this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of events. Thank you for joining me.